Good morning, everyone. We are in week six of our study of Exodus part two. That will be lesson 15 in your binders today. Now, last week we learned that Yahweh is the one that is in control. He is the one that calls the shots. It is his covenant. Um, it is uh, He decides what worship unto him looks like, what relationship with him looks like. And today we are going to see God give Moses um, more detail on what worship unto him looks like by giving him the details of the building of the tabernacle. Now for today, I am not going to be doing the teaching. We are having... Sarah from Northview Community Church um, that has actually taught this lesson a while back. Um, she gave us permission to use this video on this teaching for today. So thank you very much to Northview and to Sarah specifically for that. So um, let me pray for us and uh, then, we'll, then we'll get into it. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for um, the privilege of us having your word. Thank you, Father, that you have given us so much, everything we need. You've given us, you've equipped us with everything we need in this life in your word, Lord. So I pray for this morning as we open up your word once again and we learn more about who you are. To us, Father, I pray that our hearts will be ready to receive your word. And I pray, Father, that you'll open up our understandings. Please speak to us. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So for that, um, here is Sarah. Enjoy. I want you to imagine that you are having a conversation with a few friends and you start getting into that discussion where you are talking about all the places in the world that you've been to. And you start listing maybe some cities and maybe you've like, I've only been to Victoria. But maybe you've traveled a bit more and you say, oh yeah, I've been to Paris or I've been to London. And your friend says, oh, did you go to the Eiffel Tower? And you're like, oh no, I just had a layover in the airport. And they're like, you can't use that on your list. It's just a layover. But they say, but you know what, though? Like, I met some people from Paris, and they told me all about it, and I'm still in contact with them, and they came to visit me. And so you had this personal experience at the airport in Paris. And so you think, I've been to Paris, right? So I had this. I, uh, years ago, we took our kids to visit friends in India, and we stopped over in Qatar, which is a small Middle Eastern country. I actually hadn't really heard about it till I knew I was going to have a stop over there. And I actually like to say I've been to Qatar, but I didn't leave the airport. But it was such an impactful experience getting off the plane as a white woman with children in this airport full of men wearing their like white robes kind of, like very, very conservative Middle Eastern country. And I did have quite a view out my window on the plane and when we got into the airport, I could kind of see what it would have looked like, okay? So I kind of feel like I had this personal experience in Qatar. I also went on another trip and visited missionaries and family in Uganda, and the plane stopped in Rwanda. It was nighttime. We were there for about half an hour, and we took off. I don't put Kigali, Rwanda on my list of places I've been. I don't really remember it. I know the plane stopped there, and that was it. So I tell you this because it reminds me of my first experience with the tabernacle. I think I was in grade six or grade seven, and I had an amazing Sunday school teacher, like one of those Sunday school teachers that you really remember. And I loved going to Sunday school that semester. I grew up going to a Dutch Christian Reformed church, and this Sunday school teacher thought, I've got these grade six kids, I'm going to create a mini tabernacle. So we spent a lot of time in Exodus 25 to 31 with all the details, and he, I don't know where he found all this stuff, but we cut out tiny little tents, and we had little nails and little twisty things that went in this piece of, um, like, plywood, kind of. And every week he'd bring it and put it on the table, and we knew the new things we were going to do. But I think back to that, and I think, that was like Paris, being in the airport and having a personal experience with the tabernacle. But I didn't actually see the Eiffel Tower or the Arc de Triomphe or the Sacre Coeur. I didn't leave the airport. So ladies, if you just read Exodus 25 to 31 and filled out your charts, I think you're still in the airport. 
okay? Like you haven't left. You, you had this experience. Maybe you can say you came to Bible study and you filled out your chart so you have a personal experience with the tabernacle, but you really don't know how it fits into the bigger story. You really haven't been sightseeing. You don't know the culture. You don't know the language. You don't know what's going on and what this is all about. This is kind of my personal experience with the tabernacle in grade six. It was tiny. It would go on the table, but I remember it, right? It had some impact. I was at the airport, but it, it didn't go beyond that. So I want us to go beyond that today, okay? We're going to ask a Bible study question, and then we're going to answer it in a couple of different ways, all right? What does this teach me or teach us about God and how he deals with his people? Now, you can ask that question after reading a lot of different parts of the Bible, but we're going to ask that question today for Exodus 25 to 31. What does this teach me about God and how he deals with his people? We're going to answer it in two ways. We're going to say God is holy. That's one thing we learn. And God has a house. Okay? So hopefully the slides help and your handout helps. Have that in front of you. More charts. See that? Exciting, exciting. Okay. When we ask the question and answer it with God is holy, we're actually going to ask two more questions. Don't get bogged down by this. What does this mean for Israel? And what does this mean for us? Okay? We're going to start with God is holy. What does this mean for Israel? How do we know that God is holy from Exodus 25 to 31? Maybe you're even thinking, what does holy mean? Okay, holy in its simplest basic terms, set apart, goodness, righteousness, better than all of us. Okay, God is holy. Now we're going to try to understand holy by understanding a lot of words that were mentioned in these six chapters. And I have a chart for you. If you'd like to jot down a few things as we go through this, you can. We're going to be talking about sacred, consecration, anointing, atonement, priest, and building materials. And you're thinking, building materials. How holy are those? But we'll get there, okay? Maybe this is your first time studying the Bible, and these are all new words to you. Maybe you've just started coming to Bible study and you've been totally overwhelmed by the book of Exodus and all of these big Bible words, okay? So I want to make this a little bit easier. With the words sacred and consecration and anointing, they're in these six chapters quite a few times, okay? Sacred, like 13 times. You can see that on your notes if you want to add it in there. Consecration, 12 times. Anointing, 10 times. So I don't have all the scriptures written down for that, but I want to give you a couple of, an exa a couple of examples so you kind of get it in the context, okay? In Exodus 28, verse 3, it says, make sacred garments for your brother and give dignity, to give him dignity and honor. He's talking about Aaron there, right? Those, all those details of the clothing, the turban, the, 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 um, the ephod, all of that is sacred. In chapter 29, 36 to 37, it says, sacrifice a bull each day as a sin offering to make atonement. We'll get to atonement after. Purify the altar by making atonement for it and atone it to consecrate it. For seven days, make atonement for it, for the altar, and consecrate it. Then the altar will be most holy, and whatever touches it will be holy. So we keep getting these words, consecrate, holy. In 30 verse 25, make these into a sacred anointing oil. Now we're just going to talk about these briefly. We don't have a lot of time to go into it in a lot of depth, but I'm pretty sure that if you think about the word consecrate, and if you've grown up in the church and you've sang a lot of hymns, what comes to mind? Take my life and let it be, right? Consecrate it, Lord, to thee. So consecrate is to give, like it's set aside, it's important, it's special, all right? Sacred, we often use the word sacred when we're comparing it with something that is secular. So sacred is more about God, secular, not about God. It's also set aside for God. It's special. It's not for regular use. Now, anointed or anointing are wor is a word that is kind of something we can do to something or something that you are. And in this case, oil was used to anoint. And again, it means it's part of this um, consecration process. It's set aside. It's special. 
I remember something being very special growing up as a young girl, and it was my Sunday shoes. And about once a year, my mom would take me to Army and Navy in New Westminster. So my parents grew up in Vancouver and then New Westminster, and we moved to Surrey, but we still did a lot in New Westminster. And once a year, you know, your feet grow, and I'd get to go and get my Sunday shoes. We called them Sunday shoes, not dress shoes, not, not you know, shiny shoes. We called them Sunday shoes because really the only place I wore them was to church, maybe the odd wedding. They were my Sunday shoes, and they were special. They were set aside. They were not for regular use. I recently moved, and you start to realize what is special to you when you move. Because I love to purge, I love to get rid of things, but there's a couple things I will not let the movers move. They go in a box, and they go in the passenger seat in my van. And that's usually a box that includes wedding pictures, maybe a few little clothing items from when my kids were babies. And they're set aside. They're not for regular use. I certainly, though, wouldn't say they're sacred, or I wouldn't say they're consecrated. But it's that kind of idea, okay? In the instructions for the tabernacle, there's a lot of sacred happening. There's a lot of consecration. There's a lot of anointing. This stuff is special. It is for a holy God. All right, let's move on to the next one, atonement. Now, the first bit of verses I read, 29, 36 to 37, I mentioned atonement several times. But in chapter 30, there's also something interesting, verses 15 and 16, receive the atonement money from the Israelites, right? They were asked to give sanctuary shekel, which was an atonement for their life. It says, making atonement for your lives in verse 16. Atonement is a really big Bible word. If you've been a Christian for a while, hopefully you've heard it because it's pretty important in understanding what Jesus did for us. But we're focusing in Exodus 25 to 31 about atonement. For the Old Testament, these people did not have a full understanding like we do of what atonement means, but they did understand that something had to happen for their sin. And we talked about that with the mercy seat, and you saw that in the video with the blood, right? They had to sacrifice for their sin. That was called atonement. Now, as I was preparing this, my youngest son, Sully, he came up to me and he saw this word. And he's like, Mom, what does that mean? Kind of tried to explain it. And then I put it into um, a, kind of a story that I thought, he'll get this. He'll understand this. My middle son, Sawyer, he plays actually quite high-level ukulele. And you're thinking, there's high-level ukulele? <laughs> oh, yes, there is, okay? The Langley Ukulele Ensemble. If you want to see or hear what high-level ukulele sounds like, Google them. They're amazing. And he has moved up quite quickly. He's the youngest in the group, so much so that the association gave him a ukulele to borrow while he is in the ensemble. And we had to take down the serial code for it, and of course I Googled it. $2,500 is how much this ukulele costs. And our whole family knows the value of this ukulele. It's about this big. So I said to Sully, I said, okay, what would happen if you broke Sawyer's ukulele? Like smashed it to smithereens. He was like, that is the sacred instrument in the house. Like, that would be awful. And I said, like, what would happen? How would you pay for it? And he's like, well, I couldn't pay for it. Well, what would, what would we do? Think about this. If you broke his ukulele, what would the consequence be? He's like, well, I guess I'd have to give him my allowance every week. I said, yeah, for the Israelites, they had to atone for their sin every week, or every day, actually. And for Sully, if he wanted to atone for breaking his brother's ukulele, he'd have to give his allowance every week, every week, every week, every week. Okay? Let's move on to high priest. Aaron, oh boy, he has a job ahead of him, and so do his sons, right? The high priest in chapter 28, verses 1 and 2 Aaron and his sons, they were going to serve as priests. In chapter 29, verse 1, it says, This is what you are to do. This is what you are to do to consecrate them so they may serve me as priests. And they go through quite a process. You talked about this, right? Seven days of consecrating. 29, verse 9, the priesthood is theirs, a lasting ordinance. So it wasn't just temporary. They weren't just coming to a church to work until, you know, another church offered them a better job. They're going to be there for a while. All right? Now, my husband travels quite a bit for work, 
And if there's a bit of a, you know, an issue with the kid's behavior, one of the things I'll say to them is, you're going to have to tell dad about this when he gets back. And their first response is often, oh, but can you tell him? Can you please explain it to him? And I thought, why do they do this? And they're like, why do they need me as the go-between here? Well, they know he's not going to really get mad at me for their behavior. I can probably explain it, soften it a little bit, even say, yep, we dealt with it. They, I dealt with it. They've had their consequence, but you, you need to know what happened. But if they go and tell him exactly what happened, they're afraid of his discipline, let's say. <laughs> okay? So in this little way, if I was explaining the high priest to my son, I'd say, you know how I sometimes will explain your bad behavior to dad when he gets home? Well, the priest kind of represented all of the Israelites before God. Okay? Does that help a little? All right. So we've got these building materials, and I didn't even begin to count how many times they're mentioned in these six chapters. I just said many, many times. Okay? But I do want to read verse 20, uh, chapter 25, 3 to 7. Okay? Because this is when God says, take an offering. These are the things I want you to collect. These are the offerings you are to receive from them. Gold, silver, and bronze. Blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and fine linen, goat hair, ramskins, dyed red, and, and, other type of durable re- and, and other types of durable leather, acacia wood, olive oil for light, spices for anointing oil and for the fragrant incense, and onyx stones, and other gems to be mounted on, mounted on the ephod and the breastplate. So one of the things you talked about in your homework was the progression of metals being more and more valuable as you go to the most holy place, right? And hopefully you even saw in the video, right? I mean, the outside um, tenting and fabric, kind of plain, but durable. But as you get closer to the holy of holies, the fabric is more beautiful. It's more more ornate. Um, It definitely helps us to understand that God is holy. As I was uh, doing a bit of research about this, Did anybody come up with anything interesting about the acacia wood? It's kind of cool. Super durable. Doesn't get wrecked by moisture very easily. It's scratch resistant. And it has antibacterial properties, which I thought was kind of neat. And I mean, if you, it's beautiful wood. And it's actually not that expensive, surprisingly enough. And that's usually because it's plentiful, right? Like, usually things get really expensive because it's hard to get to it. But acacia wood would have been easy for them to find, but it would have been really, really strong. Really strong. Now, we're building a house right now, and I'm sure our builder has a long list of building materials. And when the house is all done, it probably is going to have, like, 80% of the same building materials your house has. Our houses are essentially the same wood, maybe concrete, and if you grew up in Ontario, lots of brick houses there, right? This was different. God's house was different. It would not have looked like the tents that the Israelites were living in. It was holy. So Exodus 25 to 31 teaches us many things about God, but one thing it for sure teaches us is that God is holy, and for the Israelites, that meant they were getting a holy place, a tabernacle. But what does it mean for us? I mean, did you know God was this holy? That this much consecrating had to happen? This much sacredness had to happen? This much anointing had to happen? This much atoning had to happen? For God to dwell among them, he had to have these priests to mediate and to go between They were consecrated and anointed. And their clothes were consecrated and anointed. Everything was consecrated and anointed because God was so holy. But ladies, this is the type of language that the New Testament uses for us as Christians. It says in 1 Peter 1, 13 to 16, and you don't have to write these all down, they're on the back of your page for later, so just listen. No, the scripture verses are on the back of your pages, so put it back. (laughs) Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. 
As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But listen to this. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Kevin DeYoung, he's an author and a preacher. He wrote a book called The Whole in Our Holiness. And one of the things he pointed out that really stuck with me is that we are saved from our sin but we are saved for holiness. We're saved from our sin, but we're saved for holiness. 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 7 says, For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. And 2 Timothy 1, 8-9 says, So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us and called us to a holy life. Who saved us? Yeah, he saved us and called us to a holy life. Listen carefully. Not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. Not because of anything we have done. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. We are called to holiness, a holiness that we cannot accomplish by ourselves. As Christians, we need to understand this, that we have been saved by a holy God who makes us holy through the blood of Jesus. The same way the blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat. He made the Israelites holy through offerings of atonement, But it was a temporary holiness. It was like the allowance for the ukulele week after week. But because of the cross, we have a way for God to look at us and see the holiness of Jesus. He doesn't see our sin as Christians. He sees the holiness of his son. And that is what makes it possible for us to sing a song like, Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. So we've talked about God being holy, which is just one of the aspects that we learn about God here. We talked about what it meant for the Israelites and what it meant for us. Now the second part of the question, what do we learn about God and how does he deal with his people, is what we're going to talk about now. How does he deal with his people in Exodus 25 to 31? God has a house. So let's do the same thing. We're going to talk about what it means for Israel and then we're going to talk about what it means for us. We learn in Exodus 25, verse 8, that God's house has a purpose. Then have them make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them. Make this tabernacle and all its furnishings exactly like the pattern I will show you. Why is God building a tabernacle? So he can dwell with his people. He loves them. He wants to be with them. All of the sacredness, all of the consecration, all of the anointing, all of the instructions for this tabernacle is God's way of saying, I want to be with you, Israel. I want to be with you. The Lord their God would now be among them. And he's making a way. It's not the ultimate way. It's not the final way. But he's making a way for them to be in relationship with them. But he's so holy So he had to have a holy house, and he chose a tent. Well, he knew that these Israelites were going to be in the desert for a while. What can we do with a tent? Yeah, we can move it. We can pack it up. We learn later on that God does get a permanent house, a temple in Jerusalem. So this is his temporary house. The tabernacle, it represented order and structure. It was beautiful. It had a continuousness, right? Those lights, the candles that had to be lit every night. It was a reminder that the Lord was with them. And in doing this, in in giving them instructions for a house, he was providing a way for them to worship him. For God to be God. For the Lord to be the Lord. He was the God who rescued them from Egypt. He was the God who had those plagues happen. So what? So that people would know that he is the Lord. That is a continuing theme here. 
so that my people will know that I am the Lord. Okay? The tabernacle means that the Lord is with them. We're going to look at a couple pictures here. I know you saw the video. I saw some of you had even printed out handouts to share with your table. Here's a very basic structure, bird eye, a bird's eye view of what the tabernacle would have looked like. But let's add some color to that. Let's make it look a little nicer. This is a bird's eye view of a rendering, kind of similar to the one we saw in the video, right? But what they've done here is they've cut open kind of the, the inner tent, the, where the holy place is and where the most holy place is. Okay, and we're going to zoom into that. So you see inside a little bit more. When, when we saw the video, it went into that first holy place, and then it went through the, cur the curtain into the most holy place. We can leave that up for a little while. So what does this mean for us? What does this building mean for us as Christians? Okay, I want you to imagine that you're five or six years old back in kindergarten. I was a kindergarten teacher for a couple of years, so I remember having my classroom set up with the stations, the water station, the rice station, the dress-up station. Most of what we do in kindergarten is to prepare us for when we're older, and kids love to play with things that they're familiar with, that they see their parents maybe do in real life, okay? So we like to play with representations of things. So let's imagine you're a kindergarten student, and for Christmas, you want that Easy Bake Oven. Who had the Easy Bake Oven? Yeah, if you're unfamiliar with the Easy Bake Oven, it's a miniature microwave, <laughs> kind of, but that you would plug in and you could actually really bake things in it, okay? Another toy that young children have are maybe model cars or model airplanes that are representations of something that's real, right? They'll have instructions, they'll have materials that are specific for that toy. Your Easy Bake Oven probably came with a little spatula, little mini one, right? So you could turn the cookie or take it off, all right? But these are just representations of something better. Now, I don't want you to be happy with the Easy Bake Oven. I want you to want a real oven eventually, right? As an, as an adult, we would have a really hard time managing our homes with an Easy Bake Oven. <laughs> it could happen, but it's not ideal. So how does this tabernacle fit into the bigger story of the Bible? I am going to call it a representation for something else, right? So let's figure out what that is. And we're going to figure this out together, okay? So you've probably seen something like this before. I'm just going to, this is going to get erased after. We sometimes call it God's redemptive story, okay? The first thing God did, creation. What did man do pretty quick? Sin. And we call it the fall. Okay? Thank the Lord we have the cross. Redemption. What do we call this at the very end? Like, we have no idea when it's going to happen, but we know it will happen. So, what do we call this? Restoration. That's right. All right. The tabernacle is somewhere around here. We are somewhere around here. All right? So we've been talking about what the tabernacle meant to the Israelites. But we're over here. So what does that mean we know? We know redemption. That's right. And we have the Bible. We know a whole bunch of stuff that happened in the New Testament, which you just started to explore at your tables with Hebrews 8 and Hebrews 9. I'm going to read a couple of these, okay? And you have a chart, another chart. If you are done with charts, then just listen, okay? So Hebrews 4, verse 14 to 17. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne with grace and confidence, so that we may receive mercy 
and find grace to help us in our time of need. All right, I'm going to fill out this chart with you. I think I have a slide for that scripture I just read. If that can go up. Uh, Is there one for Hebrews 4? No? Okay, well then I'm going to read Hebrews 8. Um, Let's get the Hebrews 8 one up there. Now the main point of what we are saying is this. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by a mere human being. Every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices, and so it is And so it was necessary for this one also to have something to offer. Talking about Jesus there, like Jesus had to have something to offer. If he were on earth, he would not be a priest, for there are are already priests who offer the gifts prescribed by the law. They serve at a sanctuary that is a copy and shadow of what is in heaven. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle, see to it that you make everything according to the plan to the pattern shown you on the mountain. So we're going to stop here. And we're going to fill out this chart together a little bit. What, what have we learned about the tabernacle here? What's it a shadow of? Heaven. That's right. What else do we learn? This one was made by people, right? man-made. Who made this one? God made. Yeah. Do we learn anything about the high priest here? Who's our high priest? Jesus is our high priest. So, because of where we are on the other side of the cross with the New Testament, we know more. All right? I'm going to read Matthew 27, verse 50. This is when Jesus is on the cross. And then Jesus cried out again in a loud voice. He gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. It's understood that the curtain that was torn here was the curtain separating the holy place from the most holy place. Okay? This tabernacle was a representation of the temple that was going to be built. And the temple still had the ark, the most holy place, with a curtain, and then the holy place. And it's understood by most scholars that this is the veil or the curtain that was torn. So what happened to it when Jesus died? Torn in to two pieces. Okay? I'm going to read one more from Hebrews 10, 19 to 22. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is, his body. Are you catching all those metaphors? And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. So what else do we learn? Who gets to go here now? Yes, we have confidence to enter. Okay. Where's Jesus now? Yeah, it says he ascended to heaven. He's next to God. In the Old Testament, we have the tabernacle, the house for God, and it's a shadow of heaven. In the New Testament, the tabernacle is called the true heaven. So this is like the model, the model airplane or the model car or the easy-bake oven for the real thing. 
okay? These are just a few of the New Testament verses that help us to understand the significance of the tabernacle in the Old Testament. The Israelites should have realized that the tabernacle meant that God wanted to dwell among them, that he, that he loved them. But because we're on the other side of the cross, we know even more about God's love. We know how much he wants to dwell with us. He loves us so much that he sent his son to die for us, to be that atonement, so that we are judged with mercy, undeserving mercy. Through Jesus, we are holy before God. We don't need Aaron or his sons. We don't need him to wear the ephod or the turban. We don't need to keep the candles burning. We don't need to keep bread on the table. Christ has done it. So as I went to Sunday school with my Sunday shoes and built that tabernacle with the tiny little tent pegs and the tiny bits of fabric, here's what I didn't learn. I didn't learn what all these tabernacle instructions and materials taught me about God. I didn't learn that God was holy. But he is, and now I know. I didn't learn what this tent would have meant to the Israelites, that he wanted to dwell with them. I didn't learn about how this was a shadow of what was to come. That the tabernacle is a shadow of heaven, that Jesus would die on the cross and the veil would be torn to make a way so we could have confidence in the most holy place, symbolizing how sin has been atoned through Jesus, his son. I didn't learn that God wants to dwell with me and that he made a way for me to be holy. Ladies, if you can study six chapters of the Bible teaching you all about the instructions and all you do is fill out your chart, you are still in the airport. And maybe you could say, well, I had a personal experience with it. I filled out a chart and I went to Bible study that's what I had. I had that when I built this miniature tabernacle. But we want to spend time in the Bible going away. Jesus is our high priest. He made a way for me. He loves me. He wants me to be holy before God so that one day I can be with him in his true sanctuary in heaven. There's nothing essentially wrong with going to Sunday school and building a tabernacle. There's nothing essentially wrong with going to an airport and not getting out of the airport and still saying, yeah, I've been to Paris. You see the parallel here? There's nothing wrong with opening your Bible and reading it. But if that's all you ever do, you don't actually learn about God. You have to ask those questions. You have to study. So did you read these chapters just so you could fill out the chart in your homework? Or are you reading your Bible and doing your Bible study homework so that you can learn something about God? I don't want you to be happy with the layover in Paris. I want you to get out of the airport. That's what our women's ministry here is all about, women discipling women. And that includes being in God's word and learning how to read it and study it. I want you to want the real thing. To read your Bible and say, what does this teach me about God and how he deals with his people? How does it point to the cross? How do I see Jesus in the tabernacle? After reading this six, these six chapters, it was probably pretty impossible. But we are not just given the book of Exodus. We are given the whole Bible. And then after we read the Bible, what can I praise him for? What can I thank him for? What can I confess what does it call you to? What can I thank him for? Ladies, don't be satisfied with the layovers and the easy bake ovens. Desire more. Want to know your God and know him through his word. Let's be women that know God through the entire word, through the entire Bible, and ultimately learn to know how much he loves us. Lord, I thank you for your entire word. I thank you that we're on the other side of the cross. That we know what you did for us. 
that we can give you our life back. Lord, take our lives. May they be consecrated to you. We thank you for Jesus and the work that he did. Thank you that you love us and have forgiven us and that you see us as holy daughters through the blood of Jesus. In all this we pray because of what your son has done. Amen. Amen.